Is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, 
that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of the uncircumcised and ate with them? Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life.
A reading from the Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The Word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. A worshiper from an inclusive church, like say an Episcopal church, one day hears a knock at her front door. Assuming it to be FedEx or UPS, the woman opens the door and instead finds a young, very well-dressed man standing before her. He's a big smile on his face and says pleasantly, hello, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Now the woman says, Come in, young man, and sit down and visit. So he looks a little confused and comes inside, and she shows him to her living room, and he sits on her couch. She offers him a fresh cup of coffee and some cookies, and then she asks, So, what would you like to talk about? And the young man pauses and says, Beats me, ma'am. No one's ever asked me in before. Sometimes our hospitality is met with a plum or renders one speechless. It's not in vogue anymore being lavishly welcome in ways small or large. Truth be told, we may have lost it in the last two years especially, or perhaps long before, but we are still in danger of losing hospitality altogether, I am afraid, at least as a Christian theological process. This was on vibrant display for me in the last two weeks in my little corner of the church world, volunteering as a secretary on the Committee for Prayer Book, Liturgy, and Music for the 80th General Convention this coming summer in Baltimore. For the first time in the Episcopal Church's history, legislative work began in advance this past fall in Zoom meetings and online public hearings. 
The goal is to try to get as much work done virtually in advance as possible before the physical in-person event. And of course, news came earlier this week that the convention will continue in Baltimore, albeit in a smaller scale and shorter length of days, making this work of the last few months quite even more important. So our committee on liturgy receives resolutions from across the church about things such as adding names to the calendar of saints or proposals of expansive language versions of the Eucharistic prayers or, as in 2018, a challenge to the church to start studying the prayer book in preparations for possible revisions. But a perennial, or is it triennial, proposal arrived two weeks ago from the Diocese of Northern California and it blew up all of the social media of the church. This proposal, this resolution was entrusted to our committee and it sought to repeal the canons of the Episcopal Church, which have said for all of about 250 years of our existence and precedes that in precedence since the church was formed, something I'm going to quote to you now. No unbaptized person shall be eligible to receive Holy Communion in this church. Yes, it is true. You wouldn't know it in the household of God known as Grace New Lenox, but the official stance of the church is that only baptized Christians may receive communion. That is a huge step better than, say, the Roman Catholic stance, but it is still conditional. Episcopalians for decades or longer have pondered this in their hearts. If we are the church that follows Jesus, who dined with tax collectors and sinners, who preached love your neighbor as yourself as the new and greatest commandment, surely we might be able to welcome all people, some far greater than tax collectors, to the receipt, the receipt of the sacrament of communion, even if they have not been baptized. But this has been met, like I said, with loud, vehemently opposed, slim majority of the church saying the traditions and foundation of our faith have always been, quote, open table, as the argument is often labeled incorrectly, open to any who wish it, but with the preparation of baptism and all the inherent joys and responsibilities, the baptismal covenant and the vows to turn and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, entail. To the people of Northern California who proposed this resolution and thus to the masses of Episcopalians who actually practice open communion in their churches, somewhat in secrecy for fear of something punitive happening to them, quite frankly, I saw one friend on social media say, and I quote, this is what happens when the lunatics are allowed to run the asylum. Well, Christians in disagreement are like wine and chocolate, cheese and crackers, peas and carrots, always paired together. From its earliest days, the Acts of the Apostles detailed the vast ecumenical divisions that existed on theological grounds. And then Peter, the rock, Cephas, basing his ministry in Jerusalem to the earliest Jewish converts to the way, which was the name of our faith at that time, and then at the other end of the spectrum, coming in hot from the road to Damascus, Paul, whose entire conversion is founded on the call to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Though they never actually argue in Acts, Paul's letter to the Galatians confirms that they had a nasty spat in Antioch at one point prior to over whether to include Gentiles into Christianity. Then came this account which is actually told first in detail by the narrator in chapter 10 of Peter having a vision in a dream at the same time that a centurion from Rome named Cornelius has a kind of reverse side of the same exact vision. Both of them come to the same conclusion. Cornelius, a Gentile, and a particularly troublesome one at that, one of the Romans in uniform, who physically were responsible for the execution of Jesus just a few years earlier. That same man dressed in that same Roman garb representing that same death of Christ was to be baptized, a Christian, according to God's wish. Peter, 
doesn't deny it, and he doesn't run from it. He accepts the fate and essentially comes to a new realization which will forever haunt, or is it destined, Christianity. Who am I to hinder God? Today's Acts lesson from chapter 11 is the exact same story from chapter 10, but solely from Peter's perspective in his own words. A story so critical the author saw fit to write it twice, back to back. This time, Peter has an audience. The Jewish Christians who are skeptical of this need to accept Gentile converts into their faith. If they are willing to accept Gentile baptisms, why on earth would they still need to be hospitable enough to welcome them to their table, be it to break bread in a mass or just to break bread. Peter recounts the details of his dream, a vision that is rich with symbolism, because that's exactly what dreams do. Our brains take nuggets of subconscious thoughts and paint a new picture with them. In this case, a struggling Peter, a Jew, raised in a faith that values purity in all forms, including the ritual of circumcision as a distinguishing factor of its males. Now he was being threatened to expand this early Christianity by welcoming the unclean embodied in those uncircumcised Gentiles, the same ones about whom Paul got in Peter's face and said they have to include in the church, you big dumb rock, allegedly. All of this is an argument greater than hospitality, like the hospitality of a kind woman letting in a speechless Jehovah's Witness. It is about inclusion, not exclusion, as a matter of principle on which to build a faith. Last week, I talked about the threefold spokes of Anglicanism that govern our realm of the faith, scripture, tradition, reason, emphasizing that reason was at play with respect to how the Spirit is speaking to her people, perhaps, about a woman's right to privacy and to choose. Quite interesting enough, I think the other two spokes are on the table this week. In my committee hearings and in the heated subsequent meeting, I spoke up and said that I was one of the many clergy in the Episcopal Church who have struggled with this and ultimately came down on the side of inclusivity. I am for open communion, even though it technically is not allowed, or as a bishop pointed out later, is not normative, which may be a key word in later adopted legislation about this issue that may ultimately help in a Title IV trial someday. That's because I'm technically in violation of my ordination vows to uphold the canons of the church when I say that all are welcome to receive communion here. Believe you me, there is a huge contingent of peers, friends, classmates from seminaries, bishops, as well as loud, young laity who are setting their hair on fire about this and would like to punish people like me for my belief. Sounds pretty Christian to me, doesn't it? Not in principle, but in practice. The tradition of the church gave us this rubric, the rule sealed into stone, but scripture such as today's reminds us that humility is still a virtue. Who was I that I could hinder God, Peter asks. Perhaps that spirit is still talking to her church today. Deja vu. So call me a lunatic, but I am a lunatic for Jesus, and I'll keep saying it, that all should be welcome to receive communion, and I'll continue to do so from the chancel steps of grace, so long as I am able to stand there and say it, I'll keep inviting people to the table instead of telling them, I'd love to give you this bread, but I need you to submit to some baptismal preparation and classes first. We can sort out the rest of the details later. Because the joy of distributing communion, bread or wine, priest or deacon or lay, is to see the face of someone maybe a child, maybe a church-weary adult who takes that bread and tastes inclusion of its kind for the first time. Here is a people, a mass, if you will, who practice this and live it out. 
that anyone can come here and approach this table and receive this sacrament. Thousands of years ago, a Gentile could be welcomed into the budding faith of a once religious Jewish believer's religion with their Mosaic law and their purity practices. And left could eat with right, and Peter could eat with Paul. A real mosaic, which is pieced together like artwork, which would start to make up the full image of what this church is really all about, founded on the principle of the new commandment to love one another. We are still working on this, but I am confident, and I stake my job on it, that at Grace, at least, we maybe are just a little bit closer to showing the world what Jesus is really like, full of welcome and inclusion, and with a love that is unconditional. Let us confess our faith using the word of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now turn to the prayers of the people. Prayers asked on our behalf for those who need healing in body, mind, or spirit, for those who have died, and for all the blessings of this life. Especially Mariana and Ken Reed, Lydia Fioka, Roger Whitehead, Bill Valentine, Bill and Mary George, Dave Warner, Joe Fuoco, Tim Whitehead, Cliff and Brenda Coulter. We remember those who have died, especially the one million victims of COVID-19 in the USA. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Scottish Episcopal Church. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the churches of St. Joseph and St. Aidan, Blue Island, St. John the Evangelist, Flossmore, St. Clements and Harvey, and St. Edward and Christ in Joliet. We pray for expectant parents, John Ferrari and Valerie Eisenbart, Glenn and Megan Hilton, Andy and Ashley Sargent Gates, Kelsey and Jimmy O'Shea, Ryan and Amira Martinson. We pray for those serving in the armed forces, Jamie Sargent, Luke Cromartz, Dean Redman, John Edstrom, Luke Hedrick, and Mark F. We pray for all those on our long-term prayer list. We celebrate all birthdays this week, especially the birthdays of Henry Stix, Parker Ferrari, and Darcy Hedrick. We give thanks for all the blessings of this life, but especially this day for the wedding anniversary of John Ferrari and Valerie Eisenbart, 
And we give thanks for the ministry of the Reverend Sue Summer, former Vicar of Grace, retiring from ministry today. For whom else shall we pray? The peace of the Lord be always with you. Whose laws are love, who 
whose ways are servanthood. And where the sun bright shining is your grace for human good. redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his son our lord bestow upon you the riches of his blessing and the blessing of god the almighty and all loving father son and holy spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever amen let us go forth in the name of christ alleluia alleluia Thanks be to God, alleluia, alleluia.